welcome to the start of a pretty impulsive and pretty unplanned new reading challenge that I'm doing. Okay, so let me quickly tell you how this all came about. For the month of July, I needed to read a book that was over 500 pages. And so for this, I planned on reading Empire of the Damned by Jay Kristoff. But I only got like a chapter into that book and I was like, you know what? My brain just cannot handle this right now. I cannot do it. So I put it aside. And then I realized that All the Colors of the Dark by Chris Whitaker was over 500 pages, which I was pretty shocked by because that is basically like a literary mystery thriller type story and I did not expect it to be that long but it is and it was a new book of the month selection and I need to go ahead and get that read so I was like perfect this will satisfy the challenge and then Fairy Lou dropped some new special editions that they are going to be releasing of Mariana Zapata books and instantly I was lust filled I was like I really want those books but me and Mariana Zapata have not gotten along in the past I have DNF'd one of her books and I've given one of them a 2.5 star but the ones that they are releasing are some of her more recent and more popular stories that get a lot of buzz and a lot of praise and I was like okay well maybe I need to give her another shot because everybody says that she writes the slowest burns of all slow burn romances and indeed the book that I'm reading right now All Roads Lead Here is over 600 pages but anyway backtracking a little bit I was like okay well what if I went ahead and did a video series where I did second chances for romance authors to see if I could actually be in their books and I was like that's a great idea I'm going to start with Mariana Zapata but then I realized that there weren't actually very many authors that I wanted to give a second chance to so I thought okay well what if I did second chance authors and new to me romance authors just in the quest to see if I could find a new favorite romance book or romance author because we all know how very very stingy I am when it comes to romance. I am very very picky and so I thought okay we're going to go on a quest. We are going to do a new video series to see if I can find me some new favorite romance authors and hence the start of this very impulsive and unplanned project and the reason why I decided to start it now is because of how long All Roads Lead Here is. I can use it to satisfy reading a book that's over 500 pages. So circling it all back and tying it all together because I realized that I kind of went on a tangent there for a little bit. But yes, yeah, so that is why I'm currently now reading All Roads Lead Here instead of All the Colors of the Dark by Chris Whitaker. I started All Roads Lead Here last night. And like I said, it's about a 17 hour long audiobook and I still have a ways to go. I would say that I'm still very, very early days in it. I am enjoying the story, but I'm having a similar problem in this book that I had in the other Mariana Zapata's. And that Mariana Zapata, the best way that I can explain it, the way that she writes is very casual. It's basically like you're sitting there having a conversation with a friend and I don't necessarily connect with that in writing style. I want something with a little bit more depth, a little bit more substance. I want to be able to connect with the writing a little bit more than I'm able to do now. But I'm going to stick it out because like I said, I'm really enjoying the story. This follows our main character who is moving back to Colorado. She lived there with her mom as a kid. And after her mom disappeared, she had to move in with her aunt and uncle and she hasn't been back since. And in that time, she has been working with musicians, helping them to write songs. And one of them was her boyfriend slash husband who ended up abruptly breaking off their relationship. So she's newly divorced. She wants to get out of the places that she's very familiar with. And so she decides to go back to Colorado. She hasn't decided whether she's going to stay there permanently. So she decides to just rent this apartment over a garage for a month. But little does she know that the apartment was put up for rent without the approval of the person who actually owned it. It was his son that put it up for rent. And so she gets there. There's all kinds of complications, but she ends up being allowed to stay for the month. You're following her. She's trying to find a job and she's basically just trying to rebuild her life and find her footing again. And we're just now getting into a point where she's having more and more contact with the father who is this game warden in Colorado. And he's a big grump, right? He is the grump to her sunshine and he really doesn't want her there. He doesn't want anything to do with her. He doesn't want to know that she is there. He wants to be able to ignore her completely. But after she helps his son with a medical emergency, he is indebted to her. And so she asks him for help because she is now working at like an outdoor sporting goods store and she knows absolutely nothing about what she's selling. And so she's like, you're a game warden. Can you please help me with all of this? And so you're following them as they're now just beginning these interactions and you're getting to know both of the characters more. And so, like I said, I'm enjoying the plot and the premise of the story and I can see where this is headed. And I think it's going to be a really good relationship, but there is just something about Mariana Zapata's writing that I don't connect with and I don't like, but I want to give it a shot. Like I want to get through the story and see if she really could be an author for me because literally everybody, when I say that I want a slow burn romance, they're like, you need to read Mariana Zapata. We're going to see if I can get through this one and really enjoy it to the point where I would want to continue with her as an author and where I could justify spending my money on that beautiful fairy loot set because that is really the ultimate goal. I really want to love this so I can buy those books, y'all. Anyway, I just wanted to come on here and open this vlog because I think my plan for now is going to be to include three books per vlog and I'm just going to kind of keep doing this series until I run out of books or authors that I want to try or until I really do find a couple new favorites. So we're going to see. I will keep you posted once I've gotten further into All Roads Lead here. <laughs>
I am currently in my office at work. I apologize for the horrific lighting. My new office does absolutely nothing for me in terms of lighting, but I am significantly farther into All Roads Lead here by Mariana Zapata, and I am absolutely living for this book, y'all. This is one of those kicking, screaming, crying, laughing books, and I'm just having the best time. I find myself giggling and smiling while I'm reading it, and I cannot believe how much I'm enjoying myself considering my past history with Mariana Zapata. This is a true slow burn, y'all. I think I mentioned it in my last clip, but this book is around 17 hours long on audio, and it's around 600 pages physically, and I only now have two hours of listening time left, and still nothing has happened between our two main characters. You can see them growing closer. You can see them really starting to trust and appreciate each other, and our female main character, Aurora, definitely has the hots for Rhodes. He is like almost a silver fox, and I am absolutely just living for that as well. I love me a good silver fox, and he is very much warming up to her, and it's just so sweet watching the development of their relationship. And I'm going to make a bold statement here and say that this is what Heartless by Elsie Silver was trying to be. This is what Heartless wanted to be when it grew up. Everybody talks about Daddy Cade, but uh-uh, we're going to talk about Daddy Rhodes here because he is chef's kiss perfection. And I'm just having such an amazing time with this. Like I said, I only have about two hours left of listening time. I don't think I'll finish it today unless I really push myself to. And I just don't want to because I'm enjoying myself so much. I could spend hours more with these characters. So even though it is a 600 page romance, it doesn't feel like a 600 page romance. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to come on here and provide like a check-in point because I will be finishing it soon and I will give my final thoughts when I'm done. But needless to say, this is a phenomenal time. I don't think it's going to be a five stars, but it has definitely renewed my faith in Mariana Zapata and I think I for sure will be reading more from her in the future. But yeah, time to get to work y'all. I just wanted to come on here and give you an update and I will check in with you probably tomorrow. <music> everyone. So I finished All Roads Lead here this morning and I really, really enjoyed it. I think I'm going to give it a four stars and I'm really pleased with that considering my past experience with Mary Anna's Bada. I just absolutely loved the characters. It was truly, truly a slow burn. I will say that towards the end, it did start feeling a little bit long and there were certain repetitive aspects to the story where specific things kept happening or specific phrases kept being used. And so for that reason, I do feel like it could have probably been cut by about a hundred pages, but that's not because because I didn't love the characters. It's not because I didn't want to spend more time with them. It's just at some point, there's really nowhere else that you can go in the story and you really just need to progress the plot. You know what I mean? And then of course, also this definitely ended with a pregnancy in the epilogue. I feel like it's in the rules for romance writers that you have to end all of your books with pregnancy in the epilogue. Now I will say throughout the story, both of the main characters did express their desire for more children. So pregnancy in the epilogue absolutely does make sense. Even though I know that it's probably more norm than not for a couple getting together to have kids and to consider kids their happy ending. I would like to see more romance authors target those who do not believe that to be the happy ending, if that makes sense. Also, one thing I really did enjoy about my audiobook reading experience is that even though there was a main female narrator, they did not have her do the male voices. There was actually a male audiobook narrator who would interject when it was the man's point of the conversation. So he didn't have his own perspective or anything like that. But I thought that it just added more immersion to the experience rather than her having to try to do male voices. And I wish that more audiobooks did that. So overall, really, really pleased with my reading experience with this one. I wouldn't say that it's a new favorite or anything, although I will say that Rhodes is definitely probably one of my new favorite love interests because I absolutely just loved him. You know, he's older, he's in his 40s, he's got that salt and pepper look going on. He's definitely a grump at first. I just loved his whole vibe. It wasn't as hard hitting as I would like it to be. There were definitely some harder hitting topics in here like death of a parent, but for the most part, it didn't get me in my feels. I didn't cry about this. The main emotions that I felt during this were like the happy, giddy, giggly kind of feelings, which is great. And everything. I still like the more harder hitting romances, but I think my experience with All Roads Lead here tells me that I can enjoy a Mariana Zapata. I will say that there is still a little bit of a disconnect between me and her writing, and I do think that lends to the fact that it is not harder hitting. I think that if her writing style was a little bit different, maybe the harder hitting aspects of this would have actually hit me a little bit differently. Anyway, y'all, I have rambled on long enough. I am very glad to have had this reading experience. I don't know when I'm going to read the next book in this vlog, but of course, once I know, you will know. So I'm going to go ahead and head into work and I will see you when I see you. Bright and days are on their way Forever they'll stay 
Hello everyone. Good morning. It is actually Tuesday, September 3rd. It is the day after the Labor Day holiday, so I'm going back to work and it's probably going to be a very busy day, so I have to make this quick. But I have now begun the next book in this series and it is Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan. So I have tried Kennedy Ryan once before. I think it was the last book I attempted in 2019 and I DNF'd it. But as I started researching romances that like might fit my criteria, I kept hearing a lot about Kennedy Ryan particularly before I let go. And so I went ahead and put it on hold at my library and it just came in. So I started this last night. I am now about 20% in. It's a pretty long audiobook for a romance. It's about 13 hours long, so it'll take me a couple of days to finish. But from what I'm understanding, this is going to be a second chance romance of a divorced couple. They were married for many years. They have a teenage daughter and a 10 year old son and they went through a very big rough patch. And I will say that there are trigger warnings in here for stillbirth. Their third child was stillborn and naturally, as you would expect, that basically changed their lives and it changed their marriage and ultimately they just could not recover from it. And so they've been divorced for about two years now and Josiah, the husband, is now starting to move on. And so right now we're really just learning about the dynamic between the two, what their current relationship is like, how they're kind of navigating these waters because like I said, they were together for a really long time and they thought they were going to be together forever and Josiah was still expecting to be together with Yasmin forever, but she was the one that initiated the divorce. And so they're all trying to navigate these waters. Naturally, they're having problems with their teenage girls. So there's that. There's a lot of mother-daughter problem dynamics. And then, of course, Yasmin is now having to try to deal with the fact that Josiah is moving on. So right now, we're very much getting to learn about them as people, who they were when they met, who they are now, all of the stuff that they've been through. And for the most part, I'm enjoying it. I have not reached that level of being emotionally connected to it, but I am only 20% in. Like I said, this is a fairly long audiobook, so I'm really hoping that this is going to get give me all the feels. I do really enjoy a second chance romance when it's done well. It doesn't always work. And you know, sometimes you always question the validity of a second chance romance, but I think that there were more extenuating circumstances that led to them not working out rather than them not loving each other and not wanting to be together, if that makes sense. So I am enjoying it and I will definitely be plugging along. I think that this is just the type of book that I need right now during a very busy season of my life. It's not something that I necessarily have to concentrate too hard on, but it is something that I feel like I can get emotionally invested in at a certain point. I am excited to continue and I will give you another update once I've reached more like the midway point of the story. So check in later. everybody. Good morning. I am just on my way to work, but before I headed out, I wanted to go ahead and give you an update on Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan because it's been over two days since I provided you with an update and I am still reading this book. This book is entirely too long for what it is because this book has literally been, for the vast majority of the book, both of these people, Yaz and Josiah, mutually pining for each other and not being able to act on it. Yasmin knows that it was her that initiated the divorce and so she doesn't feel like she has any right to be jealous when Josiah dates that she doesn't have the right to tell him how she's feeling and Josiah doesn't trust Yasmin anymore. So this is really just about them trying to figure out this dynamic and wanting each other at the same time. They're definitely still very much in love with each other. They're very much attracted to each other. They want each other and while I definitely understand the depth that Kennedy Ryan is attempting to put into this story because there are a lot of heavy topics. I think I mentioned in my past clip that they lost a baby. That is basically going to ruin absolutely anybody. That is like a really big part of their issues and their trauma because because they never really dealt with this together. They both had their individual ways of grieving and they both kind of resented each other for their individual ways of grieving, right? Yasmin really wanted to lose herself in the grief. She wanted to take time to be still and to process and Josiah could not. He needed to be moving. He needed to be active. He needed to take his mind off the grief and he had a restaurant to run so he needed to keep the roof over their head. So they both had very, very different ways of grieving and they never really took the time to grieve together. They grieved separately in their own separate ways and they both didn't understand the other's way of grieving 
everything. And so Yasmin ultimately just found Josiah to be a painful memory of the things that she's lost. And so she decided to ask for a divorce. And so, like I said, it's been about two years since all of this went down and they're still trying to grapple with it. They're still trying to work through it because they both run a restaurant together. So there is definitely a lot of depth and substance to this story and the things that are going on in it. And I really, really appreciate that. But overall, I just feel like this is very long for what it is. It's caused me to fall behind in my Slayer Fest readathon because I dropped prompt number two over 24 hours ago and I haven't been able to start it yet because I am still working on this book. So I really need to get it done. My plan is to get it done today, but I'm not going to be able to get it done until later today. So I probably won't even be able to start my prompt two book until tomorrow. Overall, I am enjoying it for the most part, but I still haven't reached an emotional connection. I still do not feel emotionally invested in the story and their outcome or anything like that. For the most part, like it's fine. I'm having a decent time with it, but I'm looking forward to being done with it later today. And I will go ahead and give you an update when I've finished it. All right, everybody. So I'm here to finally wrap up before I let go by Kennedy Ryan. I apologize for any background noise you hear. My husband is in the living room watching a show. He just had surgery yesterday, which is why I didn't update yesterday, even though I had finished the book already by that point, because we spent the morning in the hospital for surgery. And then we had to go back to the ER later that afternoon because he was having some nose bleeding that would not stop. But anyway, it is all fine. He is good. He's just going to have a couple of weeks of recovery. So it's going to be a little bit rough, but he is recuperating out there on the couch. Anyway, I finally, finally finished before I let go. And I don't necessarily think that I have too terribly much more to say about the story. I stand by what I said before in that this book is entirely too long. And I feel like if it had been cut down by possibly at least 50 pages, it would have been paced so much better. There would have been less repetitiveness, less redundancy in the story. I feel like it would have flowed better. It would have kept my attention more. It would have been more engaging. And I might have been able to actually emotionally connect to the characters, which I actually never ended up being able to do. You know, for all intents and purposes, this book should have been right up my alley. You know, it's got those harder hitting elements. It's definitely a character driven story. I should have loved this, but for some reason, the execution of it just didn't work for me. And I don't know whether it was because of the length. I don't know whether it was because of Kennedy Ryan's writing style. I honestly do not know, but I never was emotionally invested in the story. However, I will say that I really did enjoy a lot of what this book was trying to do, especially in terms of mental health representation, because like I said, our main character Yasmin went through it. She lost her baby and she went through an extreme period of grief and depression where she could barely get out of bed. She thought about taking her own life. And so that was well represented here. And also therapy. There was a lot of positive discussion about therapy. So a lot of great mental health representation was in the story. And I do like the second chance. I do like a lot of what this book was trying to do. It's just, it did not necessarily work for me in the way that I was hoping and expecting it to work, if that makes sense. But I am glad that I read this. I'm happy to have given Kennedy Ryan another shot and to just kind of determine that she might not be for me as an author. And now we can move on to the next book whenever that will be. So whenever I start the next book, I will come on and I will let you know. <music> Everybody. I wanted to come on here and just do a quick update because I have started the next book for this vlog. However, I'm going to be fully transparent and I'm going to say right now that I don't actually know if I'm going to be continuing with it. At this point, I would say that I'm over 35% of the way through the book. I'm probably nearing 40% and it has not gotten to a point where I'm absolutely in love with this book and I can't put it down and I just am dying to know what is going to happen. This could potentially be a DNF and I might need to go ahead and extend this out to four books books just because I want three full complete reads when I do these vlogs. But for right now, what I'm reading is Binding 13 by Chloe Walsh. Now this is a book that I was very nervous to pick up. It is not something that I ever would have picked up on my own, but literally everybody and their mother who has read this book has absolutely loved this. This is probably one of the most popular romance books that I see going around everywhere. And everybody says that it's hard hitting. Everybody says that they were in tears by the end of it. Like literally, this is the book that people recommend when you want a good emotional read. And and of course, I wasn't convinced because this is a YA romance, but I was like, you know what? Okay, I will go ahead and give it a shot. And like I said, almost 40% into the book, I am not entirely sold. This is an extremely long book, y'all. If I understand correctly, what I'm listening to right now is only part one. I don't know if they were originally published as one or if they are considered two separate books, but I am reading part one and it's a 17 hour long audiobook. And so far at 40% in, absolutely nothing really has happened between our main characters. They've had some very limited content 
contact and they're definitely attracted to each other but that is about it. This follows our main character Shannon and she has recently transferred to Tomming College and the reason is is because she was severely severely bullied at her former school. Like she's been severely bullied her entire life and so she has just been tormented the entirety of the time that she has been in school and finally it was the final straw after something pretty bad happened to her and so she was transferred to Tomming College which luckily is where her two best friends are currently going. So she's going there she's feeling safe and then on her very first day she has a chance encounter with Johnny who is the star of the rugby team. He accidentally kicks a ball into her head causing a concussion and obviously he feels terrible about that. He helps her, he takes her to the nurse's office, you know he stays with her and makes sure that she gets the help that she needs and I should also mention that Shannon's home life is not great. Her father is an alcoholic and it sounds like he might also be abusive although I haven't seen any of that on page. He's a very temperamental kind of unstable man. He doesn't love Shannon. She is kind of a waste to him. He's very much focused on his sons of which he has five so she is the only girl so she doesn't have a great home life. She obviously has not had a great school life and now she's just kind of finally starting to find her footing, starting to find her way at Tommen because she feels safe. She's got her best friends there. Nobody teases her. Nobody bullies her. And then Johnny after this chance encounter he can't really stop thinking about her. There's just something about her that is on his mind but he can't afford to be distracted because you know he has a big rugby career in mind. So he's very much all about his health and his body. He works out. He eats clean. You know rugby is his whole entire life and he's actually just coming back from an injury. He's got like something wrong with his groinal area. I'm not entirely sure what it is but he's still kind of suffering from that and it makes being attracted to women a little bit painful if you get my drift. But yeah we're currently in this phase where they're both kind of eyeing each other. Johnny of course is supposed to stay away from Shannon. I think Shannon is aware of this but you know they'll still casual glances across the room at each other but also she is young. At the start of this book she's not even quite 16. She's almost 16 and he is going to turn 18 in a few months. So they are a couple of years apart. We're just kind of watching them individually as they are going through their life and all of the things that are happening and you know it's okay. I will say that it definitely reads older than YA in some ways just because there are a lot of adult things happening. There's definitely also a lot of adult language but then there's also a lot of talk about dicks and masturbating and all of this stuff and I'm just like how many times can we talk about that? So it definitely gets really old. It's really not something that I'm connecting to in that way and I think I'm going to go ahead and give it until 50 51 percent and if it doesn't get any better I'm going to go ahead and just DNF it. I'm enjoying it to an extent but just it's like nothing mind-blowing for me. I will also say that I am listening to this via audio and I don't necessarily love the narrators. I don't feel like their voices fit the characters especially the voice that they chose for Johnny. He's got a very like more high-pitched kind of voice and I don't feel it fits like this very tall muscular badass kind of rugby player and so that is taking me out of the story as well. I don't know there are just a few things that are not quite working for me with this story. We're gonna see. Like I said I am gonna continue and we'll see how it goes. But anyway I've been talking about this way too long at this point. I'm gonna go ahead and get back to sprints and I will come back on here when I've either DNF'd it or with a mid book check-in. Okay, so it is later the same day and when I tell you that not only did I not DNF Finding 13, but I am now 70% of the way through it. I have only about two and a half hours of listening time left and I will finish it tomorrow. I'm not exaggerating. This book slowly snuck up on me and completely took my whole attention and now I'm invested. What I'm really appreciating about this story is slow burn doesn't necessarily feel like the right word, although it is definitely a slow burn because we are 70% of the way in and still nothing romantic has happened between these two characters. They've had some more interactions, they've gotten to know each other, but they're still very much apart. They're not even really considered friends. And you kind of realize that our main character Shannon's situation is incredibly volatile because of her family situation. Kind of just even talking to Johnny and being around Johnny puts her in danger from her father. Like he is not a good man and her living situation is awful and all that she has is her older brother Joey to protect her. I'm absolutely infuriated at her mother. I just, I will never be able to understand. I try to get into their mindset and I try not to judge, but women who refuse to leave abusive partners when there are children involved and who are able to excuse the behavior away, it just boggles my mind. And that's exactly what Shannon's mother is. And not only that, but she continues to have more babies by this man. It's really infuriating because Shannon literally has no one but her older brother. She's safe nowhere. And then of course you have Johnny who is dealing with some of his own BS, but he 
is from a very privileged family. He doesn't have the same concerns. Right now, his whole focus is on rugby and the injury that he is nursing. So you're following them separately for most of the book and you're really, really getting to know them as characters. And that is what I love. Like you're following them over several days, several weeks, even several months as they're like living their lives and they're going through it. Then you're also seeing those interactions together. And I think I fully started to get more invested in the story once I was seeing their interactions together. And now I just, I'm waiting for it. Like I'm waiting for the moment that it all comes together and I'm, I'm here for it y'all. So don't know if this is going to be like a new favorite. I don't know if I'm going to fall in love with it. Like everybody else has fallen in love with it, but I do know I'm absolutely eating this up. So I wanted to come on here and do this update because I legitimately think that I'm going to finish it really soon. And I don't know if I'm going to have another opportunity to update you before I finish it. So consider this my mid book check-in, even though I'm now three quarters of the way done, I'll check in with you when I've actually finished it. Hi friends. So it is now Monday morning and I'm heading into work, but I wanted to give you a quick update because last night I did end up finishing Binding 13, but they split the audiobook for some reason. So I listened to part one and for some reason I was also thinking that they had split like the actual physical book. But when I was looking into it, I don't think that's the case. I just think that it's a really long book and so they split up the audio. And so when I saw that part two was significantly shorter than part one, like part one was 17 hours and part two was 11 hours, I was like, okay, let me go ahead and just pick this next one up, especially since it was immediately available from my library. And also I kind of wanted to see where the story was going to go because I am legitimately hooked. Now, is this too long? Yes, absolutely. And I find that there is definitely a lot of repetitiveness happening, a lot of like back and forth going on between the characters. But I'm finding that my experience with this is kind of like a darker, grittier One Tree Hill. And so I'm not really hating how long this is. And I'm kind of deeply invested. And I feel like it's a really great opportunity to get some character development. Now, I do find myself a little bit frustrated at points just because Shannon is completely the opposite of a badass independent female character. Between the torment that she's experienced at school and between her family situation, she has been completely beaten down essentially by life, almost literally, if you think about it. She has kind of been conditioned to believe that she is worthless, that she is a burden, that nobody loves her, nobody could ever love her. So throughout this story, she's just consistently apologizing all the time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Or she's always saying, I'll do what you want to do, what you want to do. You know, I'm okay with whatever. She doesn't want to be a burden. She doesn't want to draw attention to herself. She doesn't want to have an opinion or anything. She's just this complete, fragile, vulnerable character. And she'll also say things like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? When anybody's just nice to her, she's not used to that. She's not used to it. And it's completely heart-wrenching to think about that this person has just been made to feel so incredibly small and worthless by the others in her life. And I just don't understand it. Like she's essentially had a target on her back since she was born from both her family and the people she's gone to school with. And I'm just like, what is it about this girl? You know, she's definitely struggling. You know, she's extremely socially awkward. She does not know how to engage in a normal conversation, especially when she's around Johnny. She's always putting her foot in her mouth. So in some ways, it's very frustrating to watch these interactions. But at the other, you completely understand why she is the way she is. I am already 36% of the way into part two. I don't think that I'm going to finish today. I will probably finish it early tomorrow. And we're still not entirely to a point where they have begun a relationship or anything like that. For Johnny, it's really complicated because at the end of the summer, he's expecting to be gone. You know, he's going to be going off to live his rugby dreams. And unfortunately, Shannon is going to be stuck right where she is. And so even though he is crazy about her, there's really nothing that he can do about it because he needs to stay focused. He can't afford any distractions. And of course, she doesn't know how to handle the feelings that she's having. And she doesn't know really how to handle Johnny being nice to her because she's just not used to that. Yes, it's drawn out. Yes, there's a lot of repetitiveness. And yes, I am very, very tired of Shannon always saying that she's sorry over and over and over. But for the most part, I'm having a wonderful time with this. And I am just rooting for these kids so hard. I absolutely love Johnny. Like I feel every person needs a Johnny in their life because he is so fiercely protective of her. And the fact that he is so patient with her, I really do want to see how this plays out. I know that there is a second book that follows Johnny and Shannon. And so I will probably be continuing in this series, quite honestly. I'm excited to see how this book ends. But anyway, that is another mid check-in because I wasn't actually expecting to go into part two, but it only makes sense since it's technically only one book. So I will not come back on here to talk to you until I've actually finished the book, but I am so surprised by how much I'm really, really having a great time with this one. Hi friends. So I am on my way into the gym, but I had to come on here and update you because I finished Binding 13 earlier this morning, but did I come on here to update you? No. And do you know why? 
it is because I immediately jumped into keeping 13. Guys, who even am I? I never do that. I never binge books in a series, but I just had to know based on where the book left off, where it was going, and the way that this book has me in a chokehold. Y'all, I cannot stop thinking about it. I was even listening when I could throughout work today because I cannot get enough. I am 100% hooked on this book. Is it perfect? No. I firmly believe that Binding 13 needed a good editing because there was a lot of repetitive moments in there, right? Like Shannon is a damsel in distress. She's in need of rescuing. And then Johnny comes to the rescue. Like I can't even tell you how many times she turns around suddenly and she knocks into a rock hard chest wall. You know what I mean? So like there were things and moments that happened over and over and over again. And like I said, there's a lot of her apologizing or being unsure of herself or just being very weak. She's a mouse y'all. She is truly a mouse of a person. By the end of book one, things were really starting to escalate. We were finally seeing something happening romantically between her and Johnny. And then things were also getting really bad for her at home. And it's like, I just needed to continue. And I'm already, I want to say maybe about 25% of the way through Keeping 13. I fully plan on getting as much of this listened to because as much as I'm loving it, it has become my entire personality. I just want to be listening to this all the time. I cannot stop thinking about it. And because of that, it's a little bit hard to get things done. Like I really need to be able to like focus on my work and focus on what I'm doing and not thinking about this book. And I cannot even believe that this book is affecting me the way that it is. I am so glad that I continued through. Like I was saying earlier, this definitely reminds me of a darker, more grittier version of One Tree Hill. So that's kind of how it feels playing out in my mind. I feel like these could absolutely be a phenomenal teen melodrama and I would probably watch it, but I'm just so glad that I'm having a good time. And even though it is now October 1st and I'm completely ignoring my October TBR, it's fine. It's only going to put me back like a couple of days, but anyway, time to go into the gym and I will check in with you when I've actually finished the book. So I'm currently sitting in a doctor's office, but you know what I realized this morning? Keeping 13, the audiobook is also two parts. So it's not a 15 hour audiobook. It is in total 33 hours. I thought I was finishing it today, but in fact, I am not. It will take at least a couple more days to finish it. So by the time I finish this book, I will have been reading nothing but these books for the past week. I wasn't mentally prepared for that. I was kind of ready to be done. Not because I'm not enjoying it. I am. I still think it's fantastic. The angst is palpable and I'm totally here for Johnny and Shannon's story, but it 100% does not need to be this long. I do believe that it is worth a two book story, but not two books of this length. You know what I mean? And I'm so invested in the story and what's happening. Like all I want to do is listen to it and it's distracting me. I need it to be done so that I can move on. Now, thankfully I was able to fit Keeping 13 into my October TV but it is still taking me longer to get through than I wanted. So I feel like I'm going to fall behind, but still really enjoying it. Still obviously going to continue with it because I can't just stop halfway through the book, but I am a little bit disappointed that part two is longer than part one. Anyway, I should probably go because the doctor could be in here at any minute, but that's the situation. And it take me away. Lord, it's come and it take That horse ride down that plane and Lord, it's coming. All right, everyone. So I'm about to actually sit down and film some videos, but just this morning, I finally, finally finished Keeping 13. So I'm able to now actually close out this vlog. Y'all, I spent nine days, nine total days with the characters and Binding 13 and Keeping 13 because they were so long. The first book between parts one and two was about a 26 hour long audio. And I think Keeping 13 was actually longer. If I remember correctly, it totaled over 30 hours. So in sum, both of the audiobooks combined was about 60 hours long. And I listened to all of it in about nine days. And that was completely not the plan. It was not expected whatsoever. However, had I realized that Keeping 13 was also a part one and two situation, I probably would not have jumped into it immediately, even though that's really what my heart wanted after finishing Binding 13. I was really caught up in the characters and their love story. The book honestly had me in a chokehold and I really just wanted to continue on and see what was going to happen. But as I was listening to Keeping 13, even though I was still very much caught up in the love story between Johnny and Shannon,
Shannon, the momentum definitely started to wane just because they were so incredibly long. I've mentioned this before throughout other clips, but both of these books really needed a good editing. There was just so much repetitiveness within the books. So many scenes happening over and over and over. And that's really why this reminded me of a melodrama, a teen melodrama like Dawson's Creek, like One Tree Hill, only I do feel like it was more on the adult side, more on the gritty side. There were a lot of very tough, difficult things, namely as it regards Shannon's family. And of course, I loved Keeping 13. By the end of it, I was ready for it to be over. I was ready to move on because at this point it is October 6th and I haven't really read anything else on my October TBR, you know, so I'm falling behind. But I am ultimately grateful for this reading experience. I'm grateful that I gave it a chance. I do understand the need for both books. I totally get it. I don't necessarily think we would have been able to fit everything in, but I don't believe that both of the books needed to be over 600 pages. So I gave Binding 13 a 4.5 stars just because of the slow start of it, because it took me over 30% to really get into it and get invested. And if you remember, I was close to DNFing it just because I really wasn't sure where it was going. So I gave it a 4.5 and of course, because of the length. And so I think for Keeping 13, despite how much I loved how it ended and I loved getting to spend more time with the characters and it absolutely broke my heart at points. Like there was just one point I was listening to it and all of a sudden I just started sobbing. It came out of nowhere. I was just like all of the emotions that had built up in me as I was listening to it just like really poured out of me. But the momentum of it definitely slowed down a lot in this book. And so I think I might be leaning on a four or a 4.5 for this one. I don't know. I just love the characters so much and I'm so excited to move on into the other ones. Like I really want to see the love stories of some of the other characters that we've gotten to know so well. And I really feel like longer contemporaries like that give me what I'm looking for. It gives me a lot of character growth and development. It gives me an opportunity to learn about the characters separately as well as together. It gives me an opportunity to really root for the relationship. It obviously gives me an opportunity to feel the sexual tension and the chemistry. And I feel like a lot of that was really in here. I absolutely adore Johnny Cavanaugh. I love what he was willing to do for Shannon. And while Shannon was frustrating to me, I can't really fault her for how she was just because of how she grew up. And you know, by the end of these two books, she really starts coming into herself. She really starts being who she was meant to be. So I thought that there was so much great character development and growth in the stories. I loved Johnny Cavanaugh's mom and dad. They were absolutely wonderful. And in opposition, I hated Shannon's family. There were parts in here that were really, really frustrated with Shannon's family and not even the dad who was doing all of the abusing, but definitely with Shannon's mom and definitely with Shannon's older brother who comes back into the picture after five years away when things start to go down and he tries to like take control. And he's really all about protecting their mother because he sees her as a victim and he doesn't really feel like she should be held accountable for anything that happened. He is really trying to meet their best interest, but he really doesn't understand. And I was really frustrated with him for just coming back after five years and thinking that he had all the answers and that protecting their mother was the right thing to do. Now, granted, he was trying to keep them all out of foster homes and I get that, but at some point she had to be held accountable. And I was so frustrated because they were all so hateful to Johnny, but he was like the one good thing in her life, the one constant, the one stable thing. And they were trying to keep her away from it. I was like, this is just absolutely ridiculous. So Chloe Walsh for sure was able to do a great job of getting all of the emotions out of me. And for that, I applaud her. I think that these were really well written and I definitely liked the adult content. And also there was a lot of really funny juvenile moments in here as well that just kind of added levity to the story overall that could be pretty heavy and pretty intense. So I had a great time with these two books. They were extremely long and I cannot believe that I spent nine days with books that were not fantasy books, but I'm not mad about it. And now it is time to move on to the rest of my October TBR and to finally close out this vlog. So overall, I feel like this vlog was a success. I very much enjoyed All Roads Lead here and I was not expecting it to. Didn't so much love before I let go. There were a lot of technical issues that I had with it and I was expecting to like it more than I did, but you know, it had been recommended to me. So I'm glad that I gave it a shot and I absolutely loved Binding 13 and Keeping 13. So far, this is going great and I'm really excited to read more in this project. So if you have any more recommendations for me, please feel free to leave those down below. I would love to hear. But I've been rambling enough. I'm going to go. And until the next installment, y'all, bye.